It's my honor to uh, introduce from our global perspective, Bill Ireland. He served as general counsel to the Agricultural Cooperative Development International and volunteers in overseas cooperative assistance <laughs> since 1991. Bill's career includes many years of diverse professional experience in law and international development. Having worked previously for the United Nations Development Program, the World Bank, the International Division of the Ford Foundation, Robert R. Nathan Associates, Commonix, and other consulting organizations, and in private practice as legal counsel to internationally oriented nonprofit organizations in New York and Washington, D.C. He's also worked or undertaken assignments for USAID and foreign governments, including the Ministry of Finance for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Bill's professional expertise and activities have comprised general legal counseling, employment law, litigation, trade and export development, finance, investment promotion. He's lived or worked in Europe, the Middle East, Africa, Central Asia, India, and the Caribbean. He belongs to the bars of New York, Washington, the District of Columbia, Virginia, and Ohio, and has published articles on such topics as educational policy, and human resource development in Jordan, law and economic development in Egypt, and investment code in Tunisia. Bill earned his JD at the University of Virginia. He's a 1962 graduate of Monmouth College and attended the University of Geneva in Switzerland. Bill is also an emeritus member of Monmouth College Board of Trustees. His father, Dallas, Ireland, was a Monmouth College senator, we believe, in the mid to late 1950s. Ladies and gentlemen, your alumnus, your colleague, Mr. Bill Ireland. Well, good afternoon. Seems we have quite a good crowd today. I'm pretty pleased to see everybody. And uh, I don't know everybody, but most everybody I do. Uh, I think most of you people know that Bill, I. Bill, can you use the mic? No, oh, yes. Speak into it. Ah, yes. Okay. Anyway, I never liked mics. I'm always putting, putting them away from my mouth. But in any case, I, I, I'm a little bit hoarse today, so I need the mic. Um, I think you all know that I'm a lawyer and a lawyer with an international background and orientation. But and certainly, it's given me quite an introduction there. But uh, I think it probably you don't know how this all happened, how it came to be that I got interested in international affairs and I ended up uh, specializing as much as I have in international uh, legal matters and uh, other similar issues. <clears throat> it really happened here at Monmouth College. Um, it happened because there was a program here, a junior year abroad program, and I think it was in its first year or second year when I signed up for it. And it was sending Monmouth College students to various universities around the world. And I signed up and was selected and sent uh, to the University of Geneva in Switzerland. And that was 1960 and 1961. And that was really quite a memorable experience for me, uh, learning to speak French or to learning to speak French better. I must say that Dorothy Donald had given me a background at the base, but I had to work hard to get, get that language up to a level where I could actually understand what the professors were telling me. Uh, but that was a very good experience and it introduced me to a completely different culture, different way of life. And in, in Europe it is quite different from here. And uh, so I think that's sort of opened my mind about what kinds of work I wanted to do and where I wanted to, to live. Uh, I, I'd also give a great deal of credit to Dr. Sam Thompson, who was my advisor to when I was here, when I was a philosophy major at Monmouth, because he really taught me how to think and how to analyze uh, issues, which, which I think I had lacked. I lacked that ability in the past, but there are other people in the room, I'm sure, that studied with Dr. Thompson and would say the same thing. But he had a great influence on my life, and that coupled with the opportunity to uh, participate in this uh, junior year abroad program really opened the door to what became quite an international life uh, for me. I'd like to just kind of summarize a little bit uh, some of the work that I did in 
have done over the years with the different organizations that, that Steve has mentioned. Um, after I went to law school, this was sort of the next step in, in the process of discovery and the process of becoming an international uh, professional. When I graduated from, <coughs> excuse me, when I graduated from the University of Virginia Law School, I was awarded a Ford Foundation Fellowship, which uh, sent me off to uh, Cairo, Egypt, to work as an intern with the United Nations Development Program for one year. Um, so that was the kind of a follow-on to the year of study that I, that I had to, uh, had in Geneva under the Monmouth College program. So after working in the UNDP office um, for an entire year, the Ford Foundation hired me as a full-time employee. But let me back up a minute and say the experience with the UN development program was equally um, impressive and, and uh, had an equal uh, level of influence over my life because the entire office was completely international. Every staff member was from a different country. And uh, of course there were Egyptians in the office too. But it turned out that they, uh, they appointed or assigned uh, the Russian uh, assistant representative to be my supervisor. And that was a very interesting thing because at that time, 1960, um, 66, 67, you will recall in the Middle East there was a great uh, rivalry between the United States and, and the Soviet Union trying to vie for influence and, and uh, over the oil producing states and, and other important states in, in the region such as, such as Egypt. So, in our office we had the situation where there was a Russian and American working together uh, very collaboratively, we were we became great friends and were, were, were really seen around town uh, as good comrades. Use that term loosely, <laughs> and, and uh, that that was a tremendous experience for me. I mean, first of all, I never met a Russian, much less had to report to one. And Anatoly, his name was Anatoly Vasiliev, was a wonderful person. He was a civil engineer with with a great. Uh, experience in his background, and and just a, a very very nice person, and a good person to work with. So you know, it taught me a lot about you've got to get to know people for their individual qualities and their character, and not just judge them by their nationality or some label that people may have put on them. And I think that that was especially true in the case of Anatoly. He was just a fine person. One story, one little anecdote I like to tell about Anatoly was um, he heard that I was a golfer and that he learned that I had joined the Gazira Golf Club in downtown Cairo and that I was playing golf. And he said, you know, we don't have golf courses in Russia. We don't know anything about golf. I'd like to know something about golf. I'd like to learn to play a little bit of golf. Can you take me out and show me? So I took him over to the driving range at the club and uh, started to give him lessons. And uh, he, he didn't get too far, but he enjoyed it, knocking the ball around a little bit. And after a while, he proclaimed to me that he said, you know, I really, I really like that golf. And you know, I think uh, I'm the very first golfer in the Soviet Union. <laughs> <laughs> I said, OK, I'll take credit for that. Why not? <laughs> so that, that, was, that gives you some idea of what kind of a relationship I had with uh, my communist boss. <laughs> Okay. I would say in that regard that several years, another anecdote, several years later, Anatoly was working with the UN, UNIDO, the UN Industrial Development Organization in Vienna. And my wife and I were passing through Vienna and we looked him up and said, let's get together and go out for dinner or something. But I don't remember how many years had gone by, but it was at least seven or eight years. And, um, and he said, that would be great. I'll come and pick you up. And I said, well, that's fine. And he said, what's the name of the hotel? And I gave him the name of the hotel. And he said, we'll be there at such and such time. So my wife and I went out in front of the hotel. And we're waiting for Anatoly to show up. And I couldn't believe my eyes. Anatoly Vasiliev, the great communist, arrives in this 
great, big, beautiful capitalist vehicle, a Mercedes-Benz sedan. Uh, I said, this man has been converted. <laughs> he's, a, he's a convert to, to golf, Mercedes-Benz, and you know, who knows what, what comes next. So that was kind of interesting. But I would say basically that my year in working with the UNDP basically it really introduced me to the whole uh, field of international development assistance. And that's where I kind of cut my teeth on this kind of a career. And uh, I learned so much about uh, how, the, how to uh, plan and de develop and manage uh, development programs. And as I said, at the end of the year, uh, the Ford Foundation offered me a, a full-time career opportunity, which I took, and I worked with the Ford Foundation for some ten and a half years after that. So that experience in Cairo really, really set me on a path to doing international work on a full-time and long-term basis, and I never really wavered from that. In one form or another, I've been living and working overseas in so many different countries uh, for my entire career, and even now, as I come to the end of my my, my career as a lawyer with uh, ACDI VOCA, I'm going to retire at the end of this month. Mm -hmm. I figure at the age of 77, it's time for a little bit of a break. Um, but in, in, in any case, this this experience uh, really set me up for a career in, in this field, and and uh, and I'm forever grateful for that. So it sort of launched my career in international development. Um, when I joined the Ford Foundation on a full-time basis, the first job they offered me was in New York at the headquarters. And I worked there as a program officer for two years. And uh, then they sent me to India, what was supposed to be a three-year assignment in India. Uh, it, it, it went well for quite a while and, until, uh, unfortunately, I had uh, an automobile accident on the road from Agra, returning from a visit to the Taj Mahal, back to, to New Delhi. I had a pretty serious automobile accident. It was really sort of a near fatal uh, accident. And I, I ended up having to uh, go home a bit early, so I didn't have the full three years in India. But I had two, two and a half really wonderful years uh, working and living in, in in India, and while there, in addition to working on all the different programs that the Ford Foundation was funding and sponsoring, I had the opportunity to do a lot of tourism, and I traveled everywhere, really from Bombay to Calcutta, up to Kashmir, all around. I really got to know India quite well, and uh, loved India. It was a great place, and it's an even better place now, I think, than it was when I was there. It's made so many uh, strides in, in terms of development, and becoming a very important player in the world economy. So anyway, uh, just to put this in some sort of a time frame, uh, I was, I was uh, with the UNDP from 1965 to 1966, then Ford Foundation from 1967 to 1977. And And then after that, I, 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 as Steve mentioned, I came back to the States and I joined um, Robert Nathan Associates, which is a premier economic consulting firm in Washington, D.C. And I worked with them for four years, did a lot of traveling and working on projects uh, overseas. to mention also that um, I never really thought about this until I got started preparing some comments for, for you all today and that was it was not something that really interested me until just now but I decided I should count up and find out how many countries I've actually <laughs> visited and lived in or worked in or actually set my foot in and uh, <coughs> counted it all up a couple of days ago, and it came to 83. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's a lot of frequent flyer mileage. <laughs> or it should be, anyway. I should get some credit for that. 
But it's been, uh, it's been great. I mean, in every respect, professionally, personally, I've learned so much uh, as an individual. And professionally, I've, I've learned so much in, in terms of what I can do as a lawyer. Because as a lawyer, I have been a little bit, um, I've sort of been, had a bifurcated life in that I've d done a lot of uh, regular corporate work, primarily with uh, nonprofit organizations that are doing uh, work abroad, not entirely, but uh, quite a bit. And I've also had uh, assignments consulting and legal assignments working on specific projects uh, in different countries where I put my legal skills to work uh, promoting an international development project that may be financed by the World Bank or the US government or whatever. And uh, as an example, um, I actually set up the Petroleum Corporation in Jamaica, and I did the same thing with the, the Petroleum Corporation in Guinea-Bissau, set up the investment authority for the government of Guinea in Africa, and that kind of thing. And in Egypt also, I was involved with an investment uh, promotion work. Um, we had, from the U.S. government, I was working at that time for Robert Nathan Associates, and we had a contract to set up a $33 million private investment fund. We called it the Private Investment Encouragement Fund. Then we called it the Pi Fund for short. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the whole, the, the whole uh, plan was for me to spend a lot of time in Egypt identifying uh, Egyptian firms that might be uh, sufficiently qualified to, to consider a joint venture with an American firm. So and then I had to look for American firms. It was kind of a matchmaking role. We had this project for three years, and we did we did manage to get a number of projects going, a number of uh, joint ventures started, and that was at a time back in the 80s when uh, American firms were not doing very well in in Egypt. And um, again, our, our relationships with the Egyptians had kind of soured on occasion, and for various reasons. But this project worked out pretty well, and, uh, and that's just one example of the kind of thing that we, we've done over, over the years. But there are many, many things like that, many projects like that. Um, let's see, I think I will just mention here the <coughs> I had meant to say this earlier that uh, I wanted to talk about some of the th kinds of work that we've done and some of the organizations that we've worked for. And we've, we've worked for some very uh, important international organizations like the World Bank, one fair amount of consulting for the World Bank and consulting for the U.S. government and, and uh, various private foundations. But um, I have something here that I'm referring to as a memorable events in my career. And I could think I, I think I could also call, call it uh, instead of the memorable memorable events uh, category, we could call it fun facts <laughs> because a lot of it is kind of interesting. Um, the first thing is that that I consider one of my great achievements, symbolically, physically, and otherwise, and that is that <clears throat> I know you're not going to believe this but I personally climbed to the top of the Great Pyramid of Egypt in 1977, 76, just before I left Egypt after my last uh, assignment in Egypt. And I had been living in Egypt off and on, different assignments, Ford Foundation and US government and what have you. And I said, you know, who knows, I may never get back to Egypt and I really want to see what it's like at the very top. So <clears throat> I went out with a couple of friends early in the morning, and it was a beautiful day. The sun was rising in the west or someplace, and east. So, you know, out there, I don't know what direction it was. But uh, <clears throat> we got there, and there were guards posted around the pyramids. And I wasn't surprised. The only thing that surprised me was that the guards were awake. <laughs> because normally they just sleep. So don't really take their jobs too seriously. However, I have to admit this as a lawyer, there was a law 
against climbing the pyramids. And it had been passed a few years ago after several people, including quite a number, I don't know how large a number, but a number of US Marines. There were a lot of people, and the Marines were among this group, that thought that this was a proof of manly, manlyhood, or manhood, or something. Uh, to, to go out to the pyramids, to the Great Pyramid, in the middle of the night, and climb up, and then turn around and get back down. And, and I think what people don't understand is that is an incredibly dangerous task. Incredibly dangerous. It's the, it's the steepness of the incline of the pyramid. You don't realize it until you actually get up there. I climbed up there in the morning when I could see everything. I can't imagine what it would be like for anybody to try to do that at night when you can't see anything. But uh, the steps were very steep. It was very tiring to go up. But going up was not really all that bad. It took a lot out of me, but it was not too bad. I got to the very top and I looked around and I said, well, this is just splendid. And uh, the sun was coming up over the Nile, and I said, it can't get any better than this. And uh, we stayed up there for about a half an hour enjoying the sunrise, and, uh, and then we said, okay, I think it's about time we go on back down. So, <clears throat> Bill, you go first. Okay. <laughs> well, I go over to the edge, and I look down, and I, I say, I can't do this. <laughs> it, it's not possible. It is so steep that if I just turn in any way, the wrong way, or if I lean forward a little bit, I'm a goner. It just, it, it was so scary, you can't imagine unless you've actually tried it. It's, it I'm glad I tried it, but, but I, would, I, I would never advise anybody else to, to do it. And not because I want to protect my record or anything. <laughs> but uh, really, it's, it's, uh, it was it, something I, I just felt like I had to do. This, Egypt had sort of become like my second home, and I had so many friends there, and, and I felt so much at home in Egypt. And I said, well, this is something I can, I can have this memory for the rest of my life, and someday at Monmouth College there'll be a gathering. I can, <laughs> I can brag about, about? I'll brag about climbing to the top of the Great Pyramid of Egypt. <laughs> and so here I am. That's why I came. Anyway, it's very dangerous, you shouldn't do it. Um, second thing that I was very impressed with was St. Catherine's Monastery. Some of you must uh, be aware of St. Catherine's Monastery, which is a Greek Orthodox monastery that was erected right out in the middle of the Sinai Desert in the 6th century. And it's been inhabited by Greek and other Orthodox priests since that time. And uh, I, I was able to go with a small group of people, I think there were eight or nine of us, uh, to go out into the Sinai and visit the monastery. Thing is, I don't know if there's a road now. There was no road in those days. So we took these cars right out into the desert and drove them right over the dunes and right over, uh, across the desert until we made it to the St. Catherine's Monastery. It was just absolutely fabulous. But. Um, I don't even know how these car, cars could withstand that. I mean, we had to stop often, and the, the drivers would get out and work on the cars. And was, this axle looks like it's a little loose. What do we do about that? You know? <laughs> anyway, that was that was great fun. Um, and of course, visiting Jerusalem, Istanbul, and Isfahan and Shiraz, places like that were also very interesting. But um, one thing that I'm particularly proud of is that. I was involved in two different attempts to try to, at least at a, a very little bit of, a little low level here, to try to make peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Now, the first go at this was back in the 19, early 1970s when the Ford Foundation decided that they would have a go at it, and so they organized a conference of uh, Israeli students in America and American universities and Palestinian students at American universities. They organized this conference to take place at the Early House in Virginia, in Northern Virginia. It's a conference center out in the countryside. Some of you may know about it. And uh, so they sent me as the sort of Middle Eastern expert at that, at that stage. They sent me to go down and, <coughs> and help to 
manage this conference and to try to get the Palestinians and the Israelis <laughs> to talk to each other and discuss their issues and hopefully make a, a, list, a little progress towards you know, some degree of harmony in the future. So we, we had this conference all set up and everybody had agreed to come and <clears throat> we were waiting for the Palestinians to arrive. The Israelis came, all students from different universities in the U.S., and then there were two or three Palestinians who straggled in, and, and we said, Where, where's the rest of your group? And they said, well, they're out in the parking lot. Well, what are they doing out in the parking lot? Well, there's some people came from, I don't know where they came from, but they're talking to them, and they, they're telling them that you really shouldn't get involved in this <laughs> process. That was back in the day when the when the Palestinians in particular, particular, but the Arabs in general, did not basically talk to Israel. It was that was their policy. We're not going to recognize them. That's giving away too much of our, you know, our rights. So that whole conference just kind of fell flat on its face. We had gone to so much trouble to set this up, and then we ended up with like eight Israelis and me and a couple of other Americans and then two Palestinians. So we didn't accomplish much. But there was another occasion where, where there was a at least a little bit more hope that something would come out of it. And that was after the death of Anwar Sadat. Uh, his wife set up the Sadat Peace Foundation and she was the president of the Peace Foundation. And uh, they set out to plan programs that would somehow try to advance uh, peace in the Middle East between the Arabs and the Israelis. So um, they then hired um, Robert Nathan Associates, no, it was another firm they, they hired to, to do a, a, a kind of a consulting sort of job, which was me and another fellow went out to Israel and to Egypt and again did something very similar that we had done uh, previously on the Pi Fund, and that was to try to identify Israeli firms that would be interested in doing business with Egyptian firms. And of course, this was at a time when there was no economic relationship between the two countries at all. So it was kind of a thankless task and probably a little bit hopeless, but people, you know, you have to try when you're trying to deal with an insoluble problem like this. But it was, uh, it was, <coughs> Interesting, we did identify quite a number of firms that said, in both Egypt and Israel, that said that we'd be interested in doing it, but we don't think our government will approve or whatever. It's, it's always some reason why it won't work. But um, from my point of view, this is I'm trying to make this point here, uh, it, was a, it provided an opportunity to meet one of the world's really, truly great statesmen and to meet him up close. That was Shimon Peres who was the then foreign minister of Israel, and he called a luncheon meeting in New York at the Hyatt Regency Hotel near Grand Central Station and invited me and two other people um, that had been involved in this, in this project and invited us for lunch. And so we sat down with the uh, Israeli foreign minister and with the Israeli ambassador to the UN and other luminaries and discussed they wanted to know exactly what are what are you guys going to do? How are you going to try to bring these people together and, and, and try to establish some sort of relationship between the different firms? So that's what the discussion was, and it was it was very it was very nice all around. Everybody was very pleasant and positive and what have you. But getting in fact, what the problem, the, the only problem we had was trying to get into the hotel because the, the Israelis have so much security that you get checked at, practically in the elevator as to who you are and what you're doing there. And, and then when we got up on the floor where the where we thought the lunch was going to be held, then, then we had to go through a gauntlet of more <laughs> Israeli security officers checking us out. And we found out the lunch was actually on two floors above that. But, so we, but in the end, we had a really nice lunch. Uh, I should just mention that We've had, during our career, we've had the opportunity to meet quite a number of celebrities and luminaries, and, and it, it's kind of fun to 
to have that happen from time to time. When I was in Egypt in 1973, you may, some of you remember that President Nixon took a trip to the Middle East at that time, and that was at, just at the beginnings of the Watergate scandal. And uh, everybody said he was just trying to divert attention by taking a trip out to the Middle East. Which is probably true. But in any case, um, I met him and his wife, Pat, uh, at a very uh, lavish uh, dinner party that, that uh, was given for the, for the president and his wife. Kissinger was there and, and other people from the US government, ambassador and all that. That was just a, a very interesting opportunity. I also met Anwar Sadat and his wife, Janine, <coughs> excuse me, Jaheen Sadat, um, a couple of times. I've, um, when I was at the Ford Foundation, of course, the Ford Foundation, we had on our board, we had Robert McNamara, Henry Ford II, and people like that, and, and we all had a chance to get to know them. That was a Again, for a simple fellow from Dayton, Ohio, that's kind of heady stuff. <laughs> Meets people with some big names. Um, but George Bundy was the president of the Ford, Town, Ford Foundation at that time, and you may remember that he was Kennedy's uh, National Security Affairs Advisor. So I got to work under him for several years, and that was a, a real learning experience. He's a very, very demanding person, an exceedingly smart person. Then. Uh, what else? Oh, I should mention that um, I also had Chuck Norris as a client. <laughs> Just a change of years a little bit. But uh, Chuck, uh, I, I don't even remember all the details now, but Chuck had, Chuck had a, I think in his family, it may have been a brother, somebody had some drug problems, and I think they were, they had worked them out, but Chuck had, had been very affected by this, and he decided to do something about it. So he he had this idea of setting up a, a, a foundation or a, chari a charitable foundation whose goal would be to try to deal with the, the drug problem so that people like his brother wouldn't be affected. <clears throat> Somehow or other, he, he got my name and called me and, and asked me to set up a private foundation called Kick Drugs Out of America Foundation. I don't know if it ever became, you know, a household word. <laughs> or if it even ever became financially successful or programmatically successful. But anyway, I had my uh, couple of days in the sun with uh, Chuck, Chuck, Chuck Norris, and he, he, he was very gracious and very, very nice. And very, um, okay, so the last thing is by, in terms of fun facts. This by no means the least important, and that is that <clears throat> I met my wife in Egypt, the first thing. She was there visiting a lady friend of hers whose husband worked in Egypt, and we met at a garden party in, in the, on the outskirts of, of uh, Cairo, and that was, we met four days before she left the country, and that was, that was enough. Four days set things in motion, and two years later we were married. But what I really want to tell you is where we were married, because I think not many people in the room can match this one. <laughs> we were married on the Rock of Gibraltar. But the reason we, it wasn't because we particularly wanted to see the Rock of Gibraltar, but the Rock, the, the government of Gibraltar only had a 24-hour residence requirement for, to get a marriage license. And the, 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 any other place was like two weeks or two months or six months or whatever. So we had quite a time getting married on the Rock of Gibraltar, and it put our marriage on a firm foundation. <laughs> I can tell you that. So here we are all those years ago. Now we're still married. They're going strong. Okay. Well, I don't think I should take any more time, any more of your time or anybody's time talking about this. But I want to show some slides of some of the different places that I've lived in and visited. And um, I have a few slides, and I also have a short um, uh, 
um, PowerPoint presentation. Same thing, it's just a, in a different form. But I wanted to know, is this a good time? Does anybody want to do any Q&A? Or does anybody have any questions about anything I've said? Oh, that's a question. I have a question. You're standing before us, so I know that you made it down from the pyramid. <laughs> but I want to know how you made I, it I, down. I didn't catch that. What was it? I didn't hear that. You, you are standing in front of us. Yes. So I know that you made it down from the pyramid. Yes, yes. But what I want to know is how you managed to do that. Very slowly. <laughs> you pay off the guards. Yeah, how much did you pay? The, the going backwards or frontwards? Yeah, no, I went backwards. The uh -huh. way you could go forward, you'd die at the yes. first step. Yes. Good question, anyway. I heard that the blocks are like three feet high. Each, each yeah, one of the boxes, it's not like a stepping step into yeah, the basement. Yeah, it's about like this and above. Something like that, yeah. yeah. And so roughly how many of levels were there? Well, I, I have absolutely no idea, but I, that's a statistic I'm sure is easily yeah. discoverable. Just, 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 uh, just an estimate, too. I mean, just to give you an, an idea of the height of this. Well, the, the height of the Great Pyramid was like 450 feet or something like that, and you can you know, imagine coming down three, 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 four feet per block. Divide that, you know, into 450. What did you do when you got down? Well, uh, <laughs> did you get avoid the guards? Did they try to arrest you? I said, you know, somebody at the Monmouth College gathering that I tell the story to is going to ask some question like this that I can't answer. <laughs> How much did you pay the government? <laughs> we, we, I didn't pay them anything, but we had somebody with us, an Egyptian, who may have possibly given them something. But I don't know why they gave them anything. They didn't do anything for us. Well, they, they, they chased me all the way to the top and said, this is terribly illegal. And I said, well, we're going to Oh yeah, well, that's, if you pay enough backsheesh to an Egyptian, you can have most anything you, you need or you want. But um, no, we didn't. Our, our guards were sleeping, and they didn't pay much attention. Hey, Bill. Yeah. Charles. Uh, Bill, uh, could you say something about um, the interface between our scheme of law and the other? nation's laws that you encountered when you were doing all this work? Uh, did, 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 did you find easy meshes? Well, you know, uh, of course, a lot of the things that we were doing when we talked about legal work that we were doing, we were doing it for an American firm or, you know, for a European firm. So we weren't really controlled by or regulated by local law. But we did, of course, a lot of things that we do in these countries. We, you have to comply with all the local laws. And you'd be surprised the extent to which uh, the legal systems in um, many, if not most, of these developing countries has really developed very considerably in the, in the last uh, couple of decades. And they've had a lot of assistance from outside sources, including the US government, setting up constitutions. Um, creating, like I mentioned, creating an investment authority as a, as a separate uh, uh, state uh, agency to, to pursue a particular goal. Things like that require uh, regulations, they require legal um, formalities that uh, have to be met. All that has to be developed and planned and put, put on paper. You don't find that in the Sharia law, let's put it that way. So, and if you go to the, the Muslim countries, you'll find that they know that, and they just adopt what, whatever they need to make their economies work. They adopt it from Western society. They don't have a problem with that. They may call it. They may, they may say it's, you know, it's our law. We we developed it, but it, you know, they, they've gotten a lot of, they've done a lot of borrowing of Western legal concepts when it comes to economics and commerce, because they can't really operate otherwise. <clears throat> and there's there there's. There's the colonial legacy as well, the British and the French, and they've left behind legal structures in most every country, and so these countries have something to work with. They have operating systems. It's more, for me anyway, 
I see a bigger problem is that knowing how to operate it and, and operate the system fairly and doing it in a way that is not, uh, you know, taking advantage of people or favoring people. That's the problem. In so many parts of the world, it's the corruption in the government officials, the people that have the power. Um, they interpret the laws the way they want, and if they don't want to follow the law, they don't. And that's more of an issue than the question of the, the actual legal framework and the legal um, regulatory order that they have. So. Okay, anybody else? Shall we see some slides? Oh, well, here's the question. How are laws enforced? Well, they are, at least on the books, they're enforced the way they would be in, in any society, including ours. I mean, they have a judicial system. Egypt, for example, has a very highly developed judicial system, and they have a much too highly developed uh, security system. <laughs> so, the, so the security police can pretty much enforce anything they want. That's, a, that's another kind of a problem. But um, the enforcement machinery, if a law is passed in, in, in the National Assembly or in, in the legislature, the, the government has the tools to enforce laws. Now maybe, maybe the tools are not used properly or maybe they're not as effective as they might be. But they're, they're there. I mean, we're not, we're not living in, it's not a world of uh, you know, primitive uh, societies. These are all pretty, basically pretty well developed societies. They, they, they just, uh, they need a lot of maturing, they need lots more experience, and, but they're getting there. That's my take on the development uh, field, is that they're making, the people we're trying to help are in fact doing better and better. They're learning, they're, they're, they're making use of good concepts and good ideas that we have to offer them or that they can borrow from us. But they always naturally uh, want to make sure that this is something that comes from them and that they own it and control it. And they don't want to say, oh, by the way, we had this professor from Harvard who came in and, and, and wrote our constitution for us. <laughs> They'll say, we wrote our constitution and the Harvard professor read it and gave us some ideas. <laughs> Okay, should we see some slides? You got the control though? Yeah, I think I do. Okay. Do you want me to get the lights or how do you? Uh, uh, what? Are the lights down? Let's see. Yeah. Okay, the light, yeah. Someplace outside of Cairo, I, I think. Could be wrong. Maybe it's inside. Of that is me. <laughs> and I don't mean the space. you can see the angle. It's funny. I want to tell you it's funny. Like, 
That's a view from my apartment in Cairo when I was there in the 80s. That's the Nile River, and that's the main part of the city of Cairo there. That's the Nile Hilton Hotel, which is a pretty famous hotel. Just some, just some guys having a smoke. Find yourself a little shade and you lie down in the shade, and that's how they keep cool. <coughs> that's the tea man. He walks around and sells cups of tea. Pretty good service. <coughs> These are very well known, very famous style of the Nile boats called the Faluka. I'm sure you may have heard of the Faluka. They have these gigantic sails, but they seem to work very well on the line. Now, that's me, and that's Anatoly. And you have to admit, he's got a, got a good posture, good, <laughs> good grip. Knees are flexed a little bit. He's obviously had some professional training. <laughs> King Farouk's palace up in Alexandria. <coughs> You'll remember the old king, Farouk. Is this sharp enough? I can't really tell yeah. what this is. Can you see it up there? Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a beautiful palace up there. Right on the Mediterranean. This is a fairly modern mosque in that time. A lot of mosques, over a thousand, they say. This is the, the uh, mosque of Muhammad Ali in the old city. And that's, this, this, this woodwork is like, it's like a window, except it, this is called Meshavea work, which is it's small, it's not filigree, but it's small uh, pieces of wood fitted together. But they're open. There's no screen on it. So it, it allows you to screen out the sun, but to allow the wind and the breeze to come through. This is a, a very old uh, style of woodwork. That's from the outside of it. This is another fairly new mosque. This is beautiful. Egyptian friend of the United Nations Development Office, the UNDP office in Cairo. This is me with my two glasses. That's Anatoly. And the three of us were constantly having arguments at the office uh, about the relative merits of either capitalism versus communism or communism versus capitalism. But it was an ongoing debate. Practically every day we were having this discussion. And it was, a, it was all just a good fun, but it was quite clear that ne neither party was going to, to convince or convert the other one. This was a 1967-68. Now there's a little story here. This is the Chinese embassy. And not surprisingly, those were Chinese. You ask what we're doing about. <coughs> we figured out that the UN, this was right across the street from our office, and we figured out they came out, Chinese staff came out once a year and cleaned and painted the fence. And then they went back in and we had to solve it. 
They just kind of disappeared inside the compound. But they did come out once a year to clean things up. And we all appreciate it. Now this is, that's me up at the, this is a much slower. Karnak, Karnak is in fact. But these are some of the Quranic scenes. I don't really want to remember all the names for all these uh, monuments, but these are just very famous. So, this is a Queen Hatshepsut, mm -hmm. and it's, a, it's one of the most impressive of the ancient Quranic monuments. It's, it, it was a monument to the Queen, and I think the Queen was very good. It just gives you some idea of what it's like in Luxor. You see the stone wall and that's just falling out of stone. Um, this is kind of not officially I mean, This is the old system. I don't think that you can even find this in Egypt anymore. This is how they used to pull water up out of the ground to, for irrigation, to go into the irrigation ditches or fields, I'm sorry. The, the, um, here would just go around endlessly around in circles and pulling water up, dumping it into a basket, and then the little boy would take it off and put it on into the field. So you advance beyond that. This is the just a scene inside one of the remaining Columbian tombs. This gives you an idea of what like King's Tuck tomb. I think this is King Tut's tomb, here. So you go in there and go deep down inside and that's where you find the, the burial chamber <coughs> and the coffin and that sort So it just gives you a good sense of what the, what the lay of the land is like in much sort of Egypt. These are gigantic buildings. I mean, they're like, I don't know. Ah yes, when the sun shines, we bring out the umbrella. Is that an old Chevy or a Chevy? Very happy, very just so 
pleased that we came to her house and she was able to entertain us. And then she came out with a green dress and some kind of material, not like gloss or whatever, but it was clearly a, a dress. And, and we had a translator there and she said, she gave this to my wife and she said, I want you to have this as a remembrance. Revisit me. This was my wedding dress. <laughs> so I don't believe it was okay. <laughs> That's the first thing. But we didn't accept it. That's Karnak again. I mean, you can take pictures of everything. All, all the it's a very seems to see Now this I told you about going out into the Sinai Desert. Those the bottle drops are the ones that typically grow out there. And we went right straight across the desert. This, these cars look like, it, like they wouldn't make it down the, the finest strip of highway in Chicago, much less in the desert. But they, I don't know, they kept them going. This was a Bedouin, a pair of Bedouin girls. Ah, me in the doom. You can call me Peter or two. Oh, this 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 guy, this was interesting too because I mean, we weren't familiar with this. This is really out in the middle of the desert in Sinai. And this guy comes up here with his camel and stops for a minute and there was music blaring from his saddle or something. And it turned out he, he had a transistor radio. We had no idea that the bed Bedouins, and this was, you know, like 40 years ago or something, he didn't think of the Bedouin having access to any kind of modern communications equipment. He had a nice transistor radio that must have, you know, a lot of This is Mount St. Catherine's and St. Catherine's Monastery in the middle of the Sinai Desert. It is quite some place. A wonderful place to visit. It would be more fun to fly in by helicopter than <laughs> to go across the desert the way we do. But it is a very beautiful area and a very lovely place to visit. And it's, it's Saint Ca Mount St. Catherine's is near the next door neighbor to Mount Sinai. So I, we climbed the very well on the top of Mount Sinai. And we the picture. Also, this is the site of, of the burning bush where God appeared to Moses. Um, and there's still a bush there, as you can see, but I don't think it's the same bush because it wasn't burning. Yeah, I know. Um, I, I think that I think that we're at the top of St. Catherine's, Mount St. Catherine's, and this is Mount Sinai. We were escorted by one of the monks. Now, we're in Jordan. We've left Egypt, now we're in Jordan, outside of Amman. I don't know if you've heard of Kepha, the rock city of Jordan. It was built by the Nabataeans in the biblical times. And it's, <clears throat> you can only get there by going through this very narrow path that goes between two walls, mountain walls. And then when you get back there, You could see just a little bit through the glass, and you could see what looks like some buildings in the background. And this is what you find. You find all these temples. This is the city of Petra. Back in Roman times. It's amazing, but it's still, you know, it's kind of... Petra is such good people. It's also amazing that the, the level of the artistry and the, and the architecture, all the stonework and the statuary, all this is, you know, 
through the, this series of times because I was pretty quick. Seems, seems you don't have to get the light up? It's, it takes a minute. Is it? It's coming. It takes a couple, couple minutes or so. Okay, this is just a little trip down to South Africa. Came down to the southernmost, well, to the Cape of Good Hope, the southernmost uh, southwestern point of the continent of Africa. Uh, <coughs> I'm to I think. I guess I push this. Get the right angle. Where do I aim it? Do I have to turn it on or something? It might be on. Yeah. I'll just use the keyboard. Yeah, I'll just use the dance. Well, that's just me at the party. And that's a guy with a bird on his hat. I don't know. <laughs> just some guy that looks like an owl. Nice kidding. <laughs> Table Mountain National Park in Cape Town. And you have to take these signs seriously. They don't want you running over their penguins and killing them. So they warn you that you know, don't move your car until you've checked underneath it to make sure there are no penguins in here. Speaking of which, Penguins. They're kind of interesting little guys. This is Cape of Good Hope. There's a nice penguin. Oh, two penguins with a guy. <laughs> Get the meaning point? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's subtle of you. <laughs> anyway, there I am pointing. Well, you know, just your average mom on street with her kids, walking down the middle of the street. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to show you some, just a handful of pictures from Morocco. It's, something that interested me and my wife. This, we're not showing pictures of mountains or beaches or anything like that. We're showing pictures of the interior of aristocratic homes from the past. There, a lot of these <coughs> homes belong to Arab nobles, and they're beautiful homes inside. They're all, always behind walls, so you don't know from the outside what's inside. But once you get inside, you're absolutely amazed. And in recent years, probably for economic reasons, a lot of the owners, these former nobles and aristocrats under the monarchy in Morocco, have started uh, renting out their homes uh, to tourists, like, like a guest house or something. They're called riads, and there are, I don't know how many, but many, many riads in, in Morocco. And they are just amazing. We've, we've stayed there. 
There's an aristocrat right there. Mm -hmm. And you're walking away from it. This is a beautiful home. This one is a beautiful home. Now this is, let's show a couple of scenes here. You probably guessed this, well, you may not be able to guess. This is in the old city of Fez in Morocco, which is a splendid place, a heritage site and all that. They still have the ancient tannery in operation, and it has a horrendous smell. But they're still using it, making money from it. And it's one part of the city that's you know, very interesting, but uh, in some respects rather sad. Not very uh, pleasing to look at. Looks like kind of a precarious place to stand <laughs> because it looks like the roof is slanted. This is the Moorish uh, architecture that you see not only in southern Spain, but of course especially in Morocco. Well, my wife again, there she is, inside a very nice mosque. I think that's in Rabat. Now, <clears throat> who can guess where this picture was taken and who the picture was taken of? It's you. You on top of the Great Pyramid. <laughs> Me on top of the Great Pyramid. <clears throat> Sun, sunrise, and this is this is what, what it's like on the very top because a, a lot of the stones have been moved from the top over the years. But there's a flat area, about as white as like me walking around this area here, and, and that's where you stand and and so watch the sun come up and, and think about getting down. <laughs> Okay, that's it. Thank you very much.